Le président, veuillez vous asseoir. The court is now back in session. Reprise de l'audience. And again, we give the floor to the prosecution la to continue the rebuttal statement. You may proceed. Allez-y. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'll le use my last five minutes before I turn Merci, the floor over to my colleague uh, to address um, uh, just a couple of issues that were that was raised by our friend uh, Sona Roon in his arguments about Moon Chea. We heard uh, an argument that there are only, only 25 confessions with annotations indicating they were sent to Moon Chea, and that this represents a small percentage of the total number of, of S21 confessions. Your Honours, I simply remind you here that when the defense referred to a total of over 4,000 confessions, that number represents unannotated original confessions that were recovered at S21. There is a relatively small number of confessions that were located outside S21 that contain annotations. So the statistical analysis that the defense Donc, uh, have relied on here is a distortion. Uh, the truth is that Noon Chea received many confessions from S21. I will not play the video clip again. You've heard it a number of times now. I'll simply remind you of Noon Chea's own words when he was asked by Ted Sambat about his receipt and use of confessions. He said, in Noon Chea's words, quote, I didn't read all the documents because there were so many. Your Honours, uh, you should also keep in mind the reason why this evidence is relevant to your judgment in this case. The defense is correct that for purposes of this judgment, you need not decide whether Noon Chea assumed complete responsibility for S21. The relevant issue that is before you is simply whether Noon Chea participated in or contributed to the CPK plan to smash enemies of the party. And in that respect, Your Honours, whether he received one S21 confession, 25 confessions, or 200 confessions, that evidence proves his knowledge of S21, it proves his involvement in the JCE through which enemies were identified and killed. De de S21, and last, Your Honours, the uh, defense uh, suggested that there is nothing in Noon Chea's interviews with La Ted Sambat in which he acknowledged his responsibility for S21. I would simply refer you to Chapter 7 of that book, a chapter titled Enemies, which is full of statements attributed to Noon Chea proving his involvement in S21, his relationship with Deutsch, and his knowledge of an agreement with extrajudicial killings of enemies. Let me give you one example and show you on the screen. Sonarun challenged us. He said, if Noon Chea had admitted this to Tet Sambat, wouldn't Tet Sambat have said so in his book? Here's what Tet Sambat said. Noon Chea doesn't apologize for S21, even though his niece and others close to him were sent there. He often stated that the enemies responsible for killing people in the countryside had to be snapped. Others were conspiring to overthrow Pol Pot and had to be stopped. But for every person they killed, they found out through the traitor's confessions obtained at S21 that there were more enemies. The arms and legs of the traitors were everywhere. And continuing, for the first 
half et plus tard, rule, au cours de la première moitié du régime des Khmer Rouges, Nunchia n'avait aucune prise directe sur S21, mais comme il était l'un des principaux dirigeants du mouvement, il participait aux décisions de purger les Hokkaïs. Et quand le Khmer Rouge Defense Minister Son Sen a été dépassé à la frontière, le frère numéro 2, In the fall of 1977, Noon Chea became the de facto head of the interrogation center, according to brother number two and testimony from Deutsch. Your Honors, uh, I simply ask you to look at all the evidence together. We've been through the evidence many times in this trial, the evidence of Noon Chea's involvement. Nous it avons vu à de nombreuses reprises des preuves montrant l'implication de Nunchea montrant au-delà du doute raisonnable que Nunchea se trouvait au cœur même du plan criminel du PCK visant à écraser ceux qui étaient identifiés today, comme des ennemis du parti. Je vous remercie. Je vais céder la parole à mon confrère qui abordera la plaidoirie de Kyusampan. Good afternoon, Your Honours. Good afternoon, Council, members of the public, Maître and civil parties. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs les Juges. Bonjour. As my tous, colleague just indicated, I will be addressing you on the evidence public. pertaining to the criminal responsibility Je vais of Kyusampan, as well la responsabilité as his role in the CPK and the PCK. Note briefly before I start a one procedural issue that arises for consideration. My friend has just made submissions in relation to the scope of the trial, which, of course, as Your Honours have indicated on numerous occasions, includes the roles of the accused in the entire regime as well as the policies of the regime. If I can add to my colleagues' submissions, there are two further reasons why evidence relating to the functioning of the regime and its policies is directly relevant to this case. My learned friend, Mr. Verkin, took us in some detail through a list of paragraphs relevant to this trial. One section that he may have omitted was that dealing with paragraphs in which allegations of the widespread and systematic attack are set out. Those paragraphs are paragraphs 1350 to 1372. They speak for themselves. Uh, they set out clearly that of relevance in this trial, in this trial, is a widespread and systematic attack against the population of Cambodia, the regime's policies, as well as the roles of the accused in the regime. There is nothing unusual about evidence of a widespread and systematic attack going well beyond issues pertaining to the responsibility of an accused. This, in fact, is a common feature of cases involving crimes against humanity, and I will refer by name only to a few cases where this is clearly set out. A recent judgment, or relatively recent, of the ICTY in the case of Lukic, 20th of July 2009, in paragraphs 890 to 894, deals with contextual elements of widespread and systematic attack and it makes details find it detailed findings on matters going well beyond the specific crimes with which the accused is charged. Blagojevich, equally an ICTY trial chamber judgment, paragraph 551. ICTY, Gakumbitsi, an appeals chamber judgment in July 2006 at paragraph 102. And what one could go on, certainly it is a common feature of these cases that contextual elements have to be proved and that they go beyond, well beyond, the specific events with which the accused are charged. There is a further reason why it is relevant for your honours to consider evidence of the contributions of the accused to the regime and to what we have called the slave state that they set up. By their very definition, 
Force transfers are continuing crimes. You heard from our learned friends, counsel for, for Mr. Kusampan, that there were a series of justifications or purported justifications for the forced evacuation of Phnom Penh, as well as the subsequent force transfers. Under international law, in order to establish that a transfer is lawful, the defense must show that as soon as the reasons for the transfer cease to exist, that the population is permitted to return. Therefore, it stands to reason that the actions of a regime, the actions of the accused in furthering and managing that regime and preventing evacuees from, ret to, from returning to their homes are directly relevant to the crime of forced transfer. Relevant authorities on that issue Et à ce sujet, uh, Stakic, Appeals Chamber of the ICTY at paragraph 284, Kerstich, Trial Chamber, ICTY at paragraph 524, and Kreishnik, Appeals Chamber of the ICTY at paragraph 725. I'll move on now from issues of procedure et and scope to deal with Kusan Pan's criminal responsibility and his role in this vast joint criminal enterprise. We've heard quite a few what I would describe as far-fetched submissions over the last few days from the defense, de and in particular from my learned friends from Kyusampan. But perhaps the most far-fetched of all was the submission that not only was Kyusampan not, not a leader, not only was he not involved in the crimes or the joint criminal enterprise, but he didn't even qualify to be a person in the leadership of the party. And why did he not qualify? Because he was an intellectual. My colleague Nick Kumjian has already referred to this point and illustrated its complete lack of a logical basis. But if I can take that one step further, was Kyu Sampan the only intellectual in the leadership of the CPK? No. Who were the other highly educated leaders? Son Sen, Ying Sari, Nguyen Chia, Khoi Tun, and the list goes on. Several leaders of the Standing and Central Committee, highly educated individuals. Kyu Sampan, in that sense, is not unique. What were his contributions to the establishment and furtherance of the joint criminal enterprise in the pre-75 period. Well, we know that he has admitted that he made an indispensable contribution to the very creation of the Funk and Grunt, the coalition which fought the war against the Khmer Republic, an extremely important political coalition which enabled the Khmer Rouge to recruit thousands upon thousands of young Cambodians to fight for, to fight for the CPK and die in their cause. Kyu Sampan was the highest ranking communist in the Funk and Grunk. He admitted in his OCIJ statement, E3-27, that he was indeed the only one, the only one who could have established that coalition with the Prince. In his submission, my learned friend Verken posed the question, when was it that Kyu Sampan accepted the use of violence? If he did, as we allege. Well, Kyu Sampan has himself provided an answer to that question. In the video which we have played a number of times in this trial, a video entitled Facing Genocide, Kyu Sampan and Pol Pot, document E3-4201, at 16 minutes, 35 seconds ah, and onward, Q Sampan explains that he joined the Khmer Rouge because they, sh they shared the same goals. 
But according to the Khmer Rouge, those goals could only be obtained through violence. And then he goes on to pose a question and answer it. When did I accept the use of violence to change the society? Answer, it was when USA used Lonol to, to occupy our country. He accepted the use of violence by his own admission in 1970, and he proceeded to further, to lead, and to encourage an enterprise which was, we allege, at its core, criminal, because it involved executions of innocent people, it involved enslavement, it involved, involved forced transfers well before the Khmer Rouge took control of Phnom Penh. Evidence of Q Sampan's support for that violence? E3-116, a statement he issued in September 1972, three years almost before the fall of Phnom Penh. He calls on the population of the city to eliminate the main traders, including Lon Nol, Sirik Matak, etc. And others and their subordinates. There you have it. 1972, Q Sampan calling for elimination of civilians and their subordinates. January 1973, a statement we've referred to a number of times in this trial, E3-637, Q Sampan celebrates in clear terms the destruction of 10 strategic villages. Are we to believe that people that lived in those villages were exclusively Khmer Republic soldiers with whom the CPK were engaged in an armed conflict? Of course not. In the same statement, he celebrates the smashing, the smashing of 10,000 245 enemy heads. In his testimony, witness Mea Swoon, who fought on one of the battlefields which Q Sampan discussed in that statement, confirmed the accuracy of the information, thereby showing that Q Sampan was in receipt of reports from the battlefield and that he used that information to issue public calls for violence to issue public calls and encouragement, as well as endorsement, for killings. When the city of Wudong fell in March 1974, he said in E3-167, quote, on 18 March, our People's National Liberation Armed Forces liberated another city, Wudong, by annihilating all the puppet soldiers there, along with their reinforcements. In other words, over 5,000 enemies were eliminated, 1,500 of whom were captured. This event happened in 1974. You have evidence before you that in that period, the Khmer Rouge, without exception, executed captured soldiers. And of course, that is what happened at Udong. Q Sampan uses his high office, the highest office held by any communist in the Funk and Grung coalition, to endorse these killings. I will now move on to deal with the participation of Q Sampan in the first forced transfer or the evacuation, forced evacuation of Phnom Penh. And I will respond to some of my learned friends' submissions. But I will also refer the court to our written brief, which deals with the evidence against Q Sampan in detail. My learned friend Gisey argued that the evidence in relation to the meeting at B5, which Q Sampan attended with Nguyen Chia, is not very credible. We strongly disagree. This evidence comes from a witness 
who in our submission was consistent, who showed clear memory, and was found not only by us, but also by Philip Short as highly credible. Of course, I'm discussing people. What is some of the evidence he gave? Or rather, let me address it this way. What are the submissions by the defence on the weaknesses in his evidence with respect to the meeting at B5? They say, well, the meeting didn't discuss any details. There were no details discussed at the meeting, and therefore, even if Kyusampan was present, even if he was there, and even if he agreed to the evacuation, well, it wasn't significant because they didn't discuss any implementation. Pierre Pond's evidence on the 26th of July 2012 and 31st of July 2012 discusses the details, a blackboard, a definition of spearheads by Pol Pot in the presence of Nguyen Chia and Ki Sampan, the issuance of instructions to various divisions as to which spearhead they were to attack. Each zone and division were given specific instructions. The very definition of the planning of an unlawful act. The next submission they made was that it is implausible, as P. Porn suggests, that there were so many commanders present, because why would they have everybody in the same place? Wouldn't that have exposed them to danger? Well, unfortunately for my learned friends, their own client has admitted otherwise. In E3-27, his OCRJ statement, he confirms he was at Pol Pot's headquarters west of Udong. He confirms he was, in his words, briefed by Pol Pot once in a while. And he confirms that other commanders, or rather commanders who commanded the battle to overthrow Phnom Penh, were also there. Tamok, Khoitun, Kepok, Son Sen, and Sao Pim from time to time. Interestingly, our friends, Council for Nguyen Chia, make the same concession at paragraph 417 of their brief, confirming that the meeting at B5 indeed discussed the liberation, as they call it, and subsequent evacuation of Phnom Penh, and that it was attended by these commanders. Is that the only evidence of Q. Sampan's contribution to the forced evacuation of Phnom Penh? Of course not. The defence were at great pains to attack and impeach the evidence of witness Nguyen Mao. What was Nguyen Mao's evidence? This man, a commune-level cadre, attended meetings in 1974 at which he learned of certain disagreements within the party leadership as to the plan to evacuate. He described for you in detail how Tamo said that every zone would be evacuated and indeed threatened people who disagreed. He also discussed another session taught by Hu Yun, who opposed the evacuations. That evidence comes from a statement he gave Ben Kiernan on the 26th of August 1981, not long after the events. And the confirmation of the authenticity of that document is given in D269-4. A correspondence from Ben Kiernan. What is Nu Mao's evidence? He confirmed in his testimony on the 19th of June of this year that he knew at that time that Q Sampan was in favour of evacuating the people and that Hu Yun did not agree. He confirmed that twice when questioned by us, asked where it was that he learned that information, he gave a specific location, consistent with his 1981 statement. Under cross-examination, our learned friends went to great length to try and confuse Nguyen Mao, who, as was obvious to everyone, is an elderly man 
was quite frail and struggling to keep up with the proceedings. They insisted on using the word position. What was the position of Kyu Sampan against his evidence where he had struggled to or where he had confirmed that he did not know Kyu Sampan's position? At, on the 20th on the 20th of June, at 14.10.52, he is asked the question as to whether or not he knew Q. Sampan's position on the evacuation. His response, no, I did not know his position, full stop. A couple of lines below, as for Mr. Q. Sampan and Mr. Hunim, I did not know them. No mention of the word evacuation. In our submission, Clearly, Mr. Numao was discussing his knowledge, or lack thereof, of the positions of Q. Sampan and Hunim. Is that the only evidence of Q. Sampan's support for the evacuation? No, there is more. P. Poon, on the 26th of July 2012, not in relation to V5, but in relation to political indoctrination sessions in the months following the fall of Udon. Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia and Kyu Sampan teaching their subordinates as to the good experiences from Udon and how those experiences will be implemented once Phnom Penh is taken. The evidence of Nguyen Mao and of Phi Poon is of course consistent with other accounts the defence's favourite witness, François Ponchot, testified on the 9th of April 2013 that the practice of evacuating the cities was so broad that everybody knew that this is what the Khmer Rouge did. And he said at 1344-46, people were evacuated, heads of groups were killed. This thing is not new that happened already since 1973. In her submissions, Madame Chia Liang referred your honours to two witnesses interviewed by Steve Hedder in E3-1714, both of whom confirm a pre-existing policy to evacuate cities and one of whom specifically said if we had captured Phnom Penh in 1974, we would have also evacuated it then. To all of this evidence, what does Q. Sampan say? In his interview with OCIJ in E3-210, he says that he didn't know. He had no idea that there was a plan to evacuate Phnom Penh. In our respectful submission, a clearly disingenuous and dishonest statement, a statement that Q. Sampan has elected not to have tested before your honours. It is therefore not entitled to probative value. But he said another thing in that interview. He said, I clearly realised that the population might have fallen along the way. In his own words, he realized that people were going to fall. In other words, people were going to die. When did that happen? In his version of the events, on the 17th of April, when he overheard a conversation between soldiers. What did he do in response to that information? in response to a realisation that people would fall and die. We've referred to this statement a number of times, but I will summarise it again. E3-118, Q. Sampan's first opportunity to address the people of Cambodia, to address the millions who had been evacuated and dispossessed. And these are his words, quote, this is our nation's and people's greatest Victory. And he celebrates how they smashed all enemy manoeuvres, how they relentlessly attacked, how they drained the enemy of all his strength, including food and rice, and how finally, quote, the enemy died in agony.
Those are the words of Kyu Sampan on the 22nd of April, 1975. He was in Phnom Penh. He saw an empty city. He saw a ghost city, emptied of the millions of its inhabitants. His response, our nation's and people's greatest historic victory. But there is even more evidence of Kyu Sampan's intent to participate, and actual participation, in the decision to evacuate. My learned friend, Gisey, referred to an interview given in 1982. This is E3-687, a New York Times interview, 9th of July 1982, in which Q. Sampan admits unequivocally and without reservation that the evacuation of the cities was a collective decision, a decision in which he in which he participated. Does he deny giving that interview? No. Does he deny saying those words? No. What do they say to explain this clear admission? Well, he was a politician, and he was making a political statement, and it was important to show loyalty. Do not be misled by this statement, Your Honours. This is an admission, and as such, it should be treated. Is that all? No. E152.1.52, a recent interview, a video interview, where he affirms that had a single voice been raised against the evacuations, there would have been no evacuations. Entirely consistent with his 1982 admission that this was indeed a collective unanimous decision. My colleague Rainer referred also to a justification he gave recently, which is remarkably consistent to justifications given by Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia and very different from that which you have been hearing from his lawyers in this courtroom. If I can move on to Q. Sampan's positions and roles in the Ministry of Commerce, and I will try and move on through this quickly, even though the material is voluminous. Why is it relevant? It is relevant because by supervising this ministry and state warehouses, he was contributing to a joint criminal enterprise to, to forcibly move people into forced labor camps, to enslave them and to subject them to inhumane conditions of life in order to extract produce, which Q. Sampan and his colleagues then withdrew and kept in warehouses in Phnom Penh. You saw in my colleague Bill Smith's submissions evidence of Q. Sampan's receipt of vast amounts of produce from, from various zones in E3-3511, including millions of kilograms of rice withdrawn from the northwest zone. role in commerce. They say, well, he was only a technical assistant. No real role, no real authority. They could not be further from the truth. This man was indeed the party center's man when it came to running the slave state on a day-to-day -day basis. Within that collective leadership, he was in charge of withdrawing produce from the cooperatives, from the slave camps, and using it as he and his colleagues determined to be appropriate. They say he wasn't in charge, it was Khoi Thun, because Khoi Thun was appointed in October and then in March 76 to deal with matters of commerce. Your Honours, what happened to Khoi Thun? He was put under house arrest in April 76, one month after being appointed to the same committee with Q. Sampan to deal with purchases from China. Where was Khoi Thun kept under house arrest? Your Honours heard evidence from his former messenger, Tian Kien, on the 2nd of May and the 3rd of May 2012, explaining 
that Koi Tun was indeed held under house arrest some 300 metres from K1, a location at which Q San Pan, Pol Pot, Nunchia and the other leaders worked on a continuous basis. The next set of submissions that I wish to address was the defence's attempt to impeach the evidence of witness Sakim Olmut. By way of a very quick summary, Sakim Olmut testified that Q Sampan and Vaughan Vett were indeed the upper echelon when it came to the Ministry of Commerce, that they supervised that ministry that they had power to direct that ministry, that the ministry had no power to do anything without their approval. Of course, they found this quite inconvenient. So in their submissions, they say, well, he was presented with documents. He was forced to say this. He was confused, or he was making speculations. Again, false. The documents I showed him when he gave that evidence, E3-1613 and E3-1614, are minutes of meetings that Sakim al himself attended. He was indeed reluctant to go into great detail on his own role during the Khmer Rouge period. But the evidence shows that he was indeed very much connected to the Ministry of Commerce and understood the matters on which he was giving evidence. Before I address that evidence, how did Sakim al respond when the defence accused him that he was just speculating? 5th of June 2012. In response to my learned friend Kong Samon's question, he says, I was not just making an assumption without any basis. I was basing that conclusion or assumption on the documents. And clearly, according to the documents, it is very likely that Hem was above the Commerce Committee. That was at 10.10.52 on the 5th of June. Then my learned friend Kong Samon asks the same question again, coming from a different angle at 10.14.29. Saki Mulmut again confirms, I am not just making assumptions. And who was Saki Mulmut? Well, he testified before your honours that he was deputy director of the Foreign Trade Bank of Cambodia. What was his proximity to Q Sampan and the Ministry of Commerce? You have on the case file nine sets of meeting minutes with foreign delegations attended by Saki Mahmoud. This man was intimately familiar with the matters he was discussing. Seven of the meetings he attended were indeed reported to Q Sampan. In a further meeting, he was in fact the most senior representative from the Cambodian side. And that is in E3-1642. When I asked him about that document on the 4th of June 2012, he did not deny that he attended the meeting and he did not disagree with me that he was the most senior person. He also received ledgers indicating the expenditure of money to purchase items from China, and one such document is at E3-336. It contains annotations referring to both Q Sampan and Saki Mahmoud. What did Saki Mahmoud do after 1979? He was a minister in the, the Democratic Kampuchea of Government presided over by Q Sampan, E3-1435. A man obviously considered competent enough, senior enough, knowledgeable enough to be Secretary of State for Supply and Transportation in the government of Democratic Kampuchea, the Q Sampan led, within months of the fall of Khmer Rouge. Is Sakim Almut's evidence out of context? Are the defence right when they say, well, it wasn't Q Sampan, it was Vaughan Vett, who was really in charge. 
On the case file, there are more than 20 reports from the Ministry of Commerce to the upper echelon. How many of those reports are addressed to Vaughan Vett? Zero. How many of those reports were addressed to Q Sampan? All of them. But they say, but Q Sampan was not Ankar. When they talk about Ankar in these documents, you should interpret that to mean somebody else, not Q Sampan. Really? In the documents addressed to Q Sampan, in those 20 plus documents, numerous references to Ankar indicating clearly that the Ministry of Commerce was communicating to Q Sampan as a representative of Ankar who would provide further instructions. And you will find that, Your Honours, in E3-2041, a report addressed to Ankar, which states, quote, I apologize, a report addressed to Q Sampan, which states, and I quote, requests Ankar to form opinion in order to inform them of this matter. Similarly, E3-2042, E3-304, and all of these reports, Your Honours, indicate clearly that the Ministry is reporting to their superior, seeking his instructions and asking for his approval or guidance. Two documents of particular interest, E3-1637, a report of the 12th of November 1978 on negotiations with Yugoslavia, again addressed to him, or rather contains an annotation already sent to Brother Hem. It says, I would like you, Brother, to be informed of this report and give your comments as guidance. Or you might say, well, that doesn't prove anything about Ankar. Let's look at another document. E3 166. 3.8 states it refers back to the document I just mentioned, saying report was made to Ankar. It confirms that the report of the 12th of November, which was submitted to Kyu Sampan, was in the, in the words of the Commerce Committee submitted to Ankar. And who was Ankar? Judge Cartwright asked that question of Professor Chandler on the 18th of July 2012. He testified that that was the collective, the leadership, the group mentioned in the standing committees that he, in committee minutes that he was looking at, including Pol Pot, Nguyen-Chir, Kisam Pan, Ying Suri, and other leaders. He confirmed that same conclusion when cross-examined by the defence on the 24th of July 2012, and he did so on several, in several instances. Well, they might say, well, Professor Chandler is merely speculating. Ankar was clearly a reference to Pol Pot, not a reference to the collective leadership. E3 slash 740, an instruction, a directive from Committee 870 on the use of the term Ankar. It criticizes Cadre for using the term to refer to individuals and says, and I quote, the term Ankar, or party, is used only for the organization. It shall not be used for any individuals. So when the Ministry of Commerce addresses Ankar, they are addressing the collective leaders, and they are addressing them through their immediate superior, Q Sampan. That much is proven beyond any reasonable doubt on the documents before your honours. I will not go in great detail uh, on the evidence of Q Sampan's participation in the party center. It's discussed in detail in our written brief. By way of a summary, he attended 86% of the standing committee minutes meetings for which minutes survive. He has admitted that he lived and worked with Nguyen Chia and other leaders, including Pol Pot, that he took part in self-criticism sessions with them, that they did nothing separately, they ate together, they did self-criticism together. He is the 
third most frequent attendee at standing committee Aux meetings. Du comité permanent, Only Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia attended more often Nguyen than Kyu San Pan. Several full rights members of the standing committee attended less frequently. The implications of that evidence that he was very much in the heart de of power, était au that he was pouvoir, with those leaders in Phnom Penh in charge, that they were a collective decision-making body, that they devised their policies and had them implemented together. Other facts of, of his politique. authority, of his actual executive authority, réelle, and his ability to contribute to this regime and this joint criminal enterprise. Evidence of witness Mayas Vaughan, I will not discuss it in detail, on the 4th of October 2012. You will recall, Your Honours, this witness describing how he, as the newly appointed Secretary of Sector 103, was instructed by Q Sampan to report to him on all matters in the sector, including the circumstances of Q Sampan's wife's relatives. What happened following that telegram? Mayor Swan and his boss, the new secretary of the North Zone, investigated the circumstances of Q Sampan's relatives. They found one of them to be imprisoned in the Siem Reap prison with 700 prisoners. The secretary of the new North Zone personally goes to the prison and arranges the release of Q Sampan's relatives. Now, the defence insists that there's some problem with this evidence because the report back to Q Sampan may or may not have been received. We say that it's completely beside the point. What the episode demonstrates is that Q Sampan, either personally or through his membership of the party centre, was able to direct a zone secretary to investigate the whereabouts of his relatives, and he was able to have his relative released from a prison in which 700 prisoners were left. You also heard evidence of a meeting on the 5th and 6th of January 1979, where Q Sampan presided in Phnom Penh, a hundred or more people attending, all of them in leadership positions. The subject of the meeting, the Vietnamese invasion. My friend Gisei takes issue, or rather says, that the fact that he was discussing enemies, well, that's normal, enemies are invading. We don't take issue with that. But what enemies was he discussing? Evidence of witness Ruth Soy, their own witness, on the 25th of April 2013, he confirms his prior statement that Q Sampan said that the problems with the Vietnamese were caused by enemies borrowing from within. A phrase your honours and this court is well familiar with. A code word for internal enemies, a code word for those to be purged. Another import of that meeting is that he was presiding over a meeting involving at least a hundred senior cadre. Again, evidence of his authority, power and influence. They take issue next with evidence of Q Sampan's role in political indoctrination. And I'm not surprised. This is very damning evidence of Q Sampan's endorsement of the JCE policies, his furtherance of the policies, his contributions to their implementation. They take issue with the evidence of Eken, the only inconsistency or alleged inconsistency in her evidence was the year in which Q Sampan taught. Q Sampan said in that session, according to Ek Hen, that Pang, a senior cadre in Office 870, had been arrested as a traitor collaborating with the Vietnamese. What is clear from her evidence is that she was not confused, though the defence for Q Sampan may have been. 
C'est peut-être une défense de quelque chose. Dans la fausse transcription de son PSA, D94-8.1, elle fait clair que les deux sessions, une en 76 ou 77, et une en 78, et que la deuxième session s'est tenue par Q. Sampan, qui avait dirigé la tribune. Cela montre gave that presentation was relevant and consistent indeed with him confirming Pang's arrest. We, of course, have evidence confirming Pang's arrest in early 1978. She confirms that in her OCIJ, the full transcript of her interview, she confirmed that in court when cross-examined by my learned friend, Mr. Verken. And she did so twice. In the transcript, of the 3rd of July 2013. On two separate occasions, she confirmed that it was Kusan Khan that gave that lesson, that it was in 1978, that it was the second and not the first session, and that the first session had indeed been taught by Noon Chia. Other witnesses who confirm Kusan Khan's participation by way of encouragement, endorsement, of the criminal policies. Moon, a civil party whose evidence they also sought to impeach. He talked about how Q. Sampan encouraged Cadre to look for those who pretended to be sick, particularly to look for infiltrated enemies, to watch new people in particular because they were steeped in feudalism. His evidence was uncertain on only one point, and that is the date of this event. He was at pains on the 28th of August and on the 29th of August to explain or to affirm for the court that he was telling the truth. And he specifically acknowledged, I may not remember the date, but I remember the event. And so his evidence stands. Other witnesses who gave similar evidence of Q. Sampan's political indoctrination, Pipun, Pan Kien, and even witnesses interviewed by Philip Short, one of whom discussed Q. Sampan's justification for the evacuation of the cities. Just, at, just as he had contributed to the forced evacuation of Phnom Penh and the criminal policies that underpinned that event, as well as the second force transfer and the killings of Khmer Republic officials and soldiers. He supported the enemy policy more broadly. Of course, you have heard now numerous occasions uncontradicted evidence that he issued the decision to kill the seven traitors. He sat in a meeting on the 8th of March 1976, E3-232, in which arrests were discussed. He was a member of the Central Committee at a time when the infamous decision on the right to smash enemies was issued. He confirmed to Steve Hedder in 1980 that all of those who were arrested were guilty. In other words, they got what they deserved. In his speeches in 1976, 77 and 78, using the highest offices in the land, he endorsed CPK's policy to search for and eliminate its enemies. That evidence is on the case file, and I don't propose to rehearse it. He also played his part in denying democratic Kampuchea atrocities, another contribution to this criminal plan. In his interview in August 1975, found in E3-119, he discussed the criticism of the democratic Kampuchea regime as propaganda designed to discredit and slander us. He said, this propaganda was nothing but an irritating and meaningless noise. And he did this on many occasions, Your an apologist and a defender of the CPK and its criminal policies. He did so after the period as well, as you well know, from his 1987 book, E3-703, in which, while acknowledging mass arrests, he said, we killed less people than died in car accidents in other countries. All of this evidence, Your Honor, shows a continuing, unreserved, active, and committed participation by this accused in the joint criminal enterprise which led 
for the crimes with which he is now charged. He was a member of the center. He was one of the most trusted people working closely with Pol Pot and Noanchir. You must not believe his assertions that he did not know, that he did not participate. The evidence exposes them as nothing but their lies. Les preuves le montrent, ce sont des mensonges and if I can pur et simple. Say a few words in conclusion, your honors, en guise de conclusion, on behalf of the office of the co-prosecutors, du bureau de la at the end of what has been a long and complex trial. Au bout d'un long et complexe procès. I wish to go back to the 17th of April, 1975. This was a day. which could have been a day of reconciliation. It could have been a day of hope. It could have marked the end of the suffering of the Cambodian people. The Khmer Rouge prevailed in the war. Their adversary surrendered. General May Sechan, in his broadcast on the 17th of April, invited them into the cities and said, the doors are open to you, calling them his blood brothers, seeking to reach out in a spirit of reconciliation, committing himself and his troops to maintaining order so that the Khmer Rouge can take power. But in their hearts, your honours, there was no room for reconciliation. There was no room for compassion. Any leader who wanted reconciliation on the 17th of April, any leader who was not intent on committing mass crimes, would have committed people to live in freedom. They would have allowed people to live with their families and in their homes. They would not have dispossessed them. They would not have forced them out of their homes and into an enslavement that was to last for almost four years. Instead, of accepting the offer of reconciliation, they set out to destroy an entire way of life and to turn a country into a suffering nation of slaves. The plan, steeped in criminality, based in the use of violence, brutality, enslavement, murder of all those who opposed or who resisted. People were out of the city, but that was not the end. They were to write biographies because searches were continue to continue for the enemies. These accused appointed themselves the masters of every life in this country. They took it upon themselves to decide who lived and who died. They brought this country to its knees. They caused the death of almost a quarter of its population. Let's not forget, Your Honours, that they institutionalized extrajudicial killings from the highest offices in this land. An order went delegating authority at every level to smash those inside and outside the ranks. An order criminal in every sense of that word. These accused and the organization they led were masters of deception and hence the use of the word Ankar, hence the use of the code 870, hence the code 870. The veil of secrecy and the rules which they imposed and implemented. But we submit, Your Honours, that that veil has been lifted. It has been lifted by evidence before you. What that evidence shows is that they ran the slave state through a highly organized, central, centralized hierarchy 
They issued directives and received reports, as you have seen time and time again. They kept themselves informed of the crimes, and they ensured that the crimes continued to be committed. Hu Sampan and Nguyen Chia are guilty of the crimes with which they are charged because they were at the heart of this joint criminal enterprise, because every crime committed was committed in furtherance of the policies they adopted. They are guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And the sentence they deserve is a sentence of life imprisonment. Nothing less can ever match or even come close to matching the gravity of the crimes that they are guilty of. We ask your honours to judge them fairly and we ask you to find them guilty and we ask you to sentence them to life imprisonment. Those are our submissions, and unless we can assist your honours further, the prosecution will rest. Nous avons donc terminé nos conclusions. Nous vous remercions. President, thank you, the prosecution. The time is now appropriate for today's adjournment, and before the Nous chamber adjourned, we would like to inform the parties to the proceeding and the public that for tomorrow's proceeding, public, the two accused and their respective defense teams will be allowed the floor to make their final statement. Pour leur déclaration finale. And in order to properly manage tomorrow's proceeding, the chamber would like to inquire from the defense teams and the true accused. De les équipes de défense that during the uh, closing les accusés sont and final statement tomorrow who will speak first either the accused or the defense team and how much time does each team need that is in ont besoin relation to the two hour time allocation as set forth Chaque by the chamber and in the case of Nguyen Chia, if he wishes to speak tomorrow, si where will he speak? Demain, will he speak from the holding cell downstairs, or will he come to the courtroom to make his speech? As for Kirsten Pond's uh, defense and Kirsten Pond himself, during tomorrow's proceeding, if the rebuttal statement made by Nguyen Chi and Nguyen Chi's defense concludes within the time allocation, and if the time is available, the chamber will give the floor to his support or his defense team la parole, to avant make their final statement. So we would like now to give the floor to Council Donc Victor Coupé to Maître enlighten Coupé. the court on the arrangement uh, within uh, your team and your clients. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Coupé. Merci, Monsieur le Président. It is the intention uh, of our client to Notre speak uh, tomorrow a approximately de one la hour and a half. Demain, uh, that is at and least demi. what he thinks uh, it will amount en to. Cas, son estimation. Obviously, he's not uh, quite sure if he will stay within the one hour and a half, Bien sûr, but that is uh, what he is now anticipating. He would also like durée, to uh, give his statement here uh, in the courtroom, not in his holding cell. The problem is, however, that um, we and also he do not feel he will be able to uh, speak for one hour and a half uh, straight in a row. So we think that it would be wise to have a pause uh, in the middle of his 90 minutes. Um, that is to said about, uh, about our client. Um, 
What I would like voilà. to ask uh, the Pour chamber is, uh, we, we know that we have in total the amount of two hours nous savons que nous disposons en that, de deux heures uh, notwithstanding de the exact amount of time that Nunjia will speak, we will be able, uh, uh, or I will be able uh, to reply to uh, the submissions of today for a period of half hour. Mon so, uh, technically or theoretically, we, we Donc, could speak a little longer than two hours, but that is then due to the fact that um, our client doesn't know exactly how long it will speak. Les heures, mais c'est parce que notre client ne sait pas exactement combien de temps il prendra. Thank you, Vito Coppé. And Coupé. yes, the International Council for Okio Sampon, you may proceed. Nous ne devrions pas occuper plus d'une heure de temps. We wouldn't need more than one euh, hour. Peut-être moins, de sorte que euh, We may need less. nous pouvons proposer à nos confrères pour Union GA d'utiliser une partie du temps we qui nous a été alloué. Quant à l'ordre des interventions, les avocats parleront en premier et ensuite M. Kiyosampan. We'll take the floor first, followed by Mr. Kiyosampan. President, uh, thank you, Council. President, merci, Maître. And thank you, everyone. The chamber will adjourn now and will resume tomorrow morning, that is Thursday, the 31st of October 2013, 2013 commencing from 9 a.m. And as uh, we just informed the parties to the proceeding and the public, tomorrow the floor will be given to the co-accused and the defense teams to make their final de rebuttal statement. Pour this information is also applicable to the support staff, and we invite all the uh, general public to attend the proceeding on time. Nous Security guards should start to take the two accused, the accused and Paul, and Nuji to the ECC detention facility and have them return to the courtroom personally tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. The court is now adjourned.